Thank you so much for joining us online, wherever you're at in the world, the state, the city. Thank you, thank you for being online. Thank you for being here live. Give yourselves a round of applause for just deciding to be here. You guys have a seat. High five somebody. Tell them it's going to be an epic day. We are in a series, a new series starting today. We're going to um, be speaking through um, the epistle called Galatians. And um, we're going to just take it kind of, not so much line by line, but definitely paragraph by paragraph. And so I was reading through it and been reading through it a couple of weeks and just trying to decide where does Holy Spirit want us to land in that and what, what would be the right thing to say and kind of address. So we're going to be in Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there. Um, but then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start there and I'm going to stay there and I'm going to pull out something that's um, not always noticed um, that happens in between two guys. Uh, the first guy is Paul, who's writing this letter. The second guy is Peter. Two, two very powerful people in the, in the very beginning stages of spreading the gospel everywhere. And so there's this, um, uh, you could call it confrontation that happens that we're going to read about in 11 through 14. And then we're going to um, just have a conversation about where we're at in the world, where you are um, on your spiritual journey, and I think you're going to walk away and realize that this is super, super practical um, to your life and, and mine as well. So Galatians chapter 2, 11 through 14. But when Peter, so Paul is writing this, but when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. Look at your neighbor and say, to your face. Because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Verse 14. But when I saw their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before everybody, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? So basically, um, what's happening in all of chap chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Galatians, Paul is kind of communicating to all of us the purity of the gospel, it's faith in Christ alone, um, and we've, we've covered that before, but he kind of hammers it a little bit more because there were people who were saying, hey, um, you have to get circumcised, plus have faith in Jesus, and so he gets word. If you'll read in there, he get, it's not like he heard this firsthand, he, somebody told him. Um, that this was happening, and so he shows up, and he confronts Peter, and so Peter is acting one way in front of a certain group of people, which is known as the Gentiles, that would be non-Jews, and he's acting a certain way in front of his Jewish brothers and sisters, because he was a Jew, and so Paul comes in, and he says, listen, because you're acting that way, you are doing a detriment or disservice to the gospel, so much so that a friend of mine, whose name is Barnabas, is being led astray by not just your words, but your conduct. And what you see happens to Peter in here is the same thing that oftentimes happens to us. All, all he did was crumble to the pressure of people. How many of you ever been somewhere, been in a, um, um, a, a family reunion, a, 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 your work, school, grocery store, anywhere, and something needs to be said, but you choose not to say it? You're like, oh, I'm going to let that slide. Or something needs to be done, but you choose not to do it because, well, I don't, I don't really want to cause any discomfort. Or how many of you ever had an awkward conversation? Right? Because of something you said, it went awkward in a hurry. And it got silent. How many, how many of you are scared of silence? Like if I was to just stop talking right now, you would start to get sweaty because something needs to be said. Like we just... Notice everybody laughing. That's called nervous laughter. I didn't say nothing funny. Everybody went... Okay, so like, we, we don't like that, and sometimes you can say something, suck all the oxygen out of the room, and nobody says anything. Have you ever been somewhere at a party, and we're all cutting up laughing, and all of a sudden everybody stops talking? Have you ever had that happen? Is that not the weirdest thing in the world? Like, you feel like, well, somebody say something. We were all joking. And so, so what happens is sometimes we crumble, I must say crumble, to the pressure of people, and we don't kind of step into and say the things that need to be said, do the things that need to be done. And all Peter lacked here, kind of what, what Paul checked him on, was his lack of courage. That's all it was. He knew the right thing to do, but he was trying to appease to both sides of the argument, and he found himself in the middle. So Paul walks up and says, listen, you can't be this way. You've got to have some courage. So out of that little section, 
God impressed on my heart last night, somewhere it started around 9 o'clock. Um, Benet said she heard me praying through the night because I know I woke up around 2.30 and made some notes. So most of these notes, you would have thought between 9 and 11, I would have ordered them a little bit better. But I thought 9 went so well, I just leave them as discombobulated as it was when we started. So, so I, you may see me scrolling and going back and forth. Um, it's not because I'm looking at pictures. It's because I'm trying to find the scripture that I've got to have at this point. But right now in your world, my world, in the world, there's all this tension and there's a lot of voices. Like there's, how, many, how many of you know there's a lot of stuff going on? And you don't know what to say, when to say it, how to say it. And so what we find ourselves doing as a church, as a Christ follower, is sometimes crumbling to the pressure of people. So what I, what I feel like Holy Spirit wants us to do today is I just want to encourage you. And that word encourage means place some courage in you. Um, because this is, this is where Peter kind of kind of faltered. And so if I was going to title um, today's conversation, um, I would say this. Um, we're going to talk about courage under fire. That, that right now in our world, you can, you can say something and people will take that and publicly shame you. You can say something, they will persecute you. You can tweet something, they will take a picture of that tweet, send it to your boss, get you fired. If you take the perspective of kingdom, and I'm not talking about Christianity, if you take the perspective of biblical kingdom right now and you start saying that the world will lash out at you and persecute you, and so we're in a battle right now between freedom and fear. We're in a battle right now between being cowards or being courageous. And, and there's no other time, in the, at least in my 47 years on the earth, that I can say in the world that if if you have a voice, if I say I do, that you need to be using it, you need to be speaking to certain things. It's just how we do that, when we do that is important, but here's what we can't do. We can't shrink back. We can't not have a voice. We can't not say something. We've got to bring, if I say the truth, now look at your neighbor who said truth and say in love. Because that's super, super important. So when you look up the biblical word for courage, Here's what it means. So every time you see the word courage, so we've all read Joshua 1, 9, be strong and, be strong and, be strong and. We did that because it says it like that many times. Okay, here's what that word means. To have strength in the face of adversity, the ability to choose to act, choose to act on one's beliefs despite danger, discomfort, disapproval, or pain. Let us say Amen. So that when, you, when God says to all of us through, through Joshua, and we read that book or we read anywhere where it says be strong and courageous, what he's saying is, is be strong and be willing to act on your kingdom beliefs even if it's dangerous, uncomfortable, or somebody might not approve of what you're saying. So Isaiah starts off and says this way, Isaiah 41.10, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. How many of you ever read scripture and like thought you knew what a word meant, but maybe not so sure, and then you just keep reading it and you go, well, that's probably not that big a deal. Um, I honestly never really knew what the word dismayed means. Anybody in here think you got a handle on that word? I would read it, I'd go, okay. Don't fear, God's with me, don't be dismayed. So I just thought that meant, again, don't be afraid. I didn't really know what that word meant, so I thought, I'm going to go to the Hebrew and I'm going to look that word up, because I don't know what that means. Um, and you can judge me, you can be more educated than me, so I knew what that means, that's great, but I didn't. So I thought, I'll go look it up. And much like most Hebrew words, it, it more paints a picture than it does give us a word, so we, we translate it um, dismayed. You could translate it panic, but here's, here's the thing. Here's the picture it paints. I love this. this I, I think scripture is awesome. You should study it. Um, how many of you know somebody that knows somebody who has one of them little tiny scared dogs? Who y'all know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about the little tiny, um, sometimes also known as a chihuahua. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You ever seen those dogs, like little tiny dogs, eyes about to snap out of their skull? Like, and everywhere they go, they're like, like, it's like and you can't say nothing to them because they're like, 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 they just bite you for no reason. You're like, what is wrong with your dog? Calm that thing down. And they, like, you walk into a room, don't say nothing to them. Like, ay, 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 run off down the fence. Like, they are dismayed. <laughs> That's what that word means. And like, 
Here's what God is saying, because he's like, you gotta, you got to see this, because I'm telling you, there are a bunch of people walking around today just like that. <laughs> scared to death. I can't say nothing, don't know where to go. I won't even come to church, because I'm afraid somebody give me the corona. We got wet like, it's just, God says, look, look, look. Don't be afraid or walk around in Chihuahua syndrome, <laughs> a.k.a. eggshells. Because <laughs> he says, listen to the words, I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will support you with my justice hand. And like we got we to understand, especially in this time, like the battle legitimately is, am I going to be courageous and step in, or, or am I going to literally be a coward? Because the opposite of courage is not fear. We think that most time it's taught that, but the opposite of courage is not fear. The opposite of courage is cowardice. And there's a couple of places I want to read to you where um, the original word literally means coward or cowardice. You know this verse, 2 Timothy 1.7. How many of you have ever recited that verse like you know what I'm talking about? For God does not give us a spirit of? Okay, that word literally means God does not give us a spirit of a coward. God does not give us a spirit of of a coward, but one of power, love, and self-discipline. The next place you see it is uh, Revelations 21, verses 1 through 8. Very, very beautiful flow of verses. It's talking about the new heaven and the new earth. Um, let's just read it. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, where the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away. Here's a, here's a section we probably all know. He will wipe away every tear from their eye and death shall be no more. There shall be no mourning, nor crying, nor pain for the former things have passed away. Somebody say amen. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will, I will be his God, and he will be my son. Verse 8, listen to this. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars, they will not inherit these things. In both places, that word cowardice or cowardly means a person who chooses not to act because of danger, discomfort, or disapproval. disapproval. Here's what it means. I'm choosing not to step in. I'm choosing not to have the conversation. I'm choosing not to do or say the thing I know that's right because it will cause me discomfort. It will make it awkward. It could cause me pain. It could cause people not to approve of me. I'd rather be liked by you than, than do what God, I know God wants me to do. That's what the word means. And so why do I pull it out of 2 Timothy and out of Revelations? It is not to scare you. Like a lot of people would use that Revelations 21 verse and say, hey, if, if you ever struggle with, with fear, then you're probably not going to make it in. No, I want you to see two things, how serious this is to God. One, so much so that he announces, I didn't give you a spirit of a coward. I gave you one of power, love, and a sound mind. And I want you to see the list, the list that he jumps it in with if you choose to do that. Like he puts it in with murderers and idolaters and sorcerers and liars and like it. So we need to know that this is a very, very serious conversation. So we need to understand, one, how, okay, well then how do I get courage? Because I don't want to be a coward. And that's the truth for everybody in here. I want to be able to step from a kingdom perspective, step in. So how do I get something that apart from God you don't have? And I'll talk about that in just a second. And then, you know, like, if you've embraced Jesus as your forgiver and leader and you're here and, like, okay, I'm pressing in, I want to I do all that I can for the kingdom, how do I develop courage? Because it is something that can be developed. It is something that you don't, like, you don't have all of it yet. Like, the Bible says that we can grow in grace, that we can go from glory to glory. What does that mean? We just improve, 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 improve. And so there is this journey that you go on that you can literally develop more and more or greater and greater courage. So how do I get something that truthfully, 
apart from Jesus, we don't have. So let me help you, especially if you're here and you're on the journey and you um, trying to figure all this out. This is not like bad news. This is good news. Apart from having a relationship with God through Jesus, um, I'm never going to be courageous from a kingdom perspective. And here's what I mean. I'm always going to choose the easiest way. I'm always going to, hey, I need everybody to like me as much as I can and make every people happy. And, you know, maybe you've kind of isolated yourself. You care about these group of people being happy, but not these group of people being happy. But you, you live in this struggle where it's all about self-preservation and, and selfishness. And, and that sounds like bad news, but it's good news because God said, well, because your heart's broken and it's banged up because of sin in the world, I sent Jesus to redeem you, to forgive you, to restore you, to make you into a new creation. Um, when you embrace him through faith, you get the mind of Christ, you get the spirit of a living God in you. Like he literally takes the spirit that is cowardly out and he puts the one of power, love, and a sound mind on the inside of you. And then now you walk courageously. Look at your neighbor and say, courageous. So that's, that's how you get it. But then once you kind of make that step, then you have to learn how to kind of um, work it out. Like it's, it's literally like a muscle that needs to be developed and worked out. So how do we, how do we develop? I'm going to give you three things that um, I think are both, we see them in like everyday life, but it's also supernatural as well. Meaning um, we understand how this works in the physical, but I'm not really sure we always understand how this works in the supernatural. So the first way that you get greater courage is greater courage comes from a deeper intimacy with God. A deeper intimacy with God. So let me help you understand what that means, because when you just get saved, you know God, you are known by God, you are a child of God, but it doesn't mean you're intimate with him. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that you like know everything there is to know about God. How many have been married for like 10 years or longer? Have you ever had a conversation with your wife or your husband 15 years into marriage and go, well, I didn't know that about you? Right? Listen, Benet and I were having a conversation uh, last week, maybe, so we'll be married 26 years coming up. What? Is it 27? See, I didn't know that. <laughs> so I'm growing in intimacy right now. <laughs> She's exercising forgiveness, and I'm finding out information I didn't know. Okay, you sure it's 27? Not even 4. That's right. That's right. It's hot. Um, <laughs> that's right. So I was, we were having a conversation, and I told her something. And she said, well, I didn't know that about you. And I was like, because I never told you. Like, it, like you just you have conversations, and you just grow. So here's, here's the cool thing. The more I know about God, the more I understand about him, the more I fall in love with him, the more I trust him, the more courageous or brave I am. Let, let me prove it to you. Um, Isaiah 26, 3 says, you keep him, if I say me, you keep him, if I say me, okay, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. I want you to listen to the language of that, that sometimes we just blow by and sometimes recite that. It says you keep him, if I say me, in what kind of peace? Perfect. Perfect. How many of you are in perfect peace 24-7? Like everything's solid. My life is dope. I don't worry about nothing because the Lord's got me. No, it's not true. You watch CNN, Fox Network, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and y'all, some of y'all lose your mind. Why? Because immediately your mind's not stayed on the Lord, it's stayed on CNN. And so there must be this, this reality that I'm in and you're in where we go, okay, okay, I need to grow in my intimacy, my intimate knowledge of God, learn how to stay my mind on him, think on things that are praiseworthy, lovely, and excellent. Why? Because the Bible says I have access to not just peace. Yes, perfect peace. Why? Because I grow in my trust in you. And so there's this journey that we're on. Psalms 27.1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? So practically, let me prove it to you. How many of you in here feel super courageous during worship? Like you're in here, you worship with the band's playing, lights are going, lights are down a little bit, there's smoke filling the auditorium, and you're, you got, like you just... Like, you feel like, man, I'm, this feels like Motley Crue concert, but, like, it's better because I'm saved. Like, I mean, I've, I've seen some of you stick your tongue out. I'm like, that dude is getting it. 
And the truth is, the truth is you, like, how, many, how many of you just, like, let's be honest. Inside, you in here worshiping, you talk about, man, I'm about, to go, I'm about to go witness to my friend. He needs to be saved. As soon as I get out of here, I'm kicking the devil in the freaking teeth, rattle, like whatever you got going on. Right? How many know what I'm talking about? You just feel that way. You get no car. It's like, well, maybe Tuesday. <laughs> he might be busy right now. <laughs> I don't want to bother nobody. What, what happened? Like, in that moment where you're connected and you're aware, like deeply aware of the presence of God, you got all this dope courage. That's available every day. You just got to grow in it. So, so how do I become more courageous? I grow in a deeper, intimate relationship with God. Um, so like, look, maybe, just maybe, tomorrow, tomorrow's what? What's tomorrow? It's Monday. Hey, hey. Maybe don't start your day with ACDC, um, you know, Hell's Bells. Probably not a good idea. Now look, I'm not the guy who's kicking secular music in the teeth. I think if you're on a date with your wife, listen to something romantic. Rattle's probably not what you want to listen to. But when you start your day, maybe, maybe not ACDC, maybe not Motley Crue, maybe not Iron Maiden. I'm showing my age. I don't know what the rest of y'all listen to, but that used to be my thing. I mean, what I'm talking about. Thank you. Okay, so. Now listen, I can still go there. If I'm lifting weights, I'll put some, you know, Barnett's put me onto some, some, oh. that's Christian music, okay? So I'm trying to get better. Yeah, anybody know what I'm talking about? That music you can't understand, but come on, it's dope. All right? But listen, the tr it's not horrible, it's great. So the truth is, truth is, like for me, maybe not you, but for me, I have to start my mind and my soul connected to God by worship music in his word so that I'll be courageous that day to make really good decisions. So, so like, if, if my struggle helps you, listen, it's okay. It doesn't make you a weak Christian. It makes you a wise Christian to start your day in his word and worship to him. So the second way, second way to grow in greater courage comes from courageous associations. Give somebody a high five next to you. Courageous associations. Deuteronomy 32, 20 says, one can put a thousand to flight, two can put 10,000 to flight. That's more than double. That's some crazy growth. So God's saying, listen, me and you together, a thousand's running from us. Me and you together with somebody else, 10,000 are checking out. So courageous association to be able to do life with people who, who are kind of moving in the same direction as you is super, super important. I'll prove it to you. How many of you have ever been uh, younger and you were like, hey, let's jump off this cliff? Notice what I said. Let's, plural. I don't know anybody that pulled up their little boat, some cliff somewhere, so I'm going to scurry up here all by myself and jump off this. Some of us would have if we jumped before, but the truth is, the truth is y'all announced in the boat, hey, who's going with me? Let's all, let's all go jump off the cliff. Like, like you, listen, listen, here's, here's the sad part. How many of you drug somebody into sin because of that? You're like, hey, I'll drink it if you will. <laughs> have you ever done that? Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand in here. Like, hey, hey, I'll, I'll smoke it if you will, boy. Like, you go first because like, I want to see if you die. Like, that's what we do, right? <laughs> Why? Because some, good or bad, courage works both ways. And what I need is somebody to go with me. So we got up on a little, on a little, <laughs> little ledge 60 feet up off the ground. I mean, the water's hard 60 feet. Ain't so soft no more. What'd you, what'd you tell the person next to you? Yeah. Because you know why? Go first. You go. If you go, I'm coming. And this guy goes, you promise? You promise? You promise? And in your male self, it was the first time you held another man's hand. Let's just go together. No <laughs> job. So look, it's, tr it's true, it's true in the natural, I'm telling you, it's true in the supernatural. If you know somebody is living kingdom with you, if you know somebody's pressing in, and listen, listen there's somebody you want to go tell about Jesus, take somebody with you. It'll be a whole lot easier. You'll have a whole lot more courage. You want to go pray for somebody who's sick, take somebody with you along and say, hey, we're going to lay hands on this person, rub them down with oil. Would you go with me? Because it looks weird. I'm, we're going to make everybody uncomfortable, but as long as we're together, we're jumping. Right? So how do we grow in courage? Have courageous associations. That's why it's important that you're in a small group. Because listen, Sunday's dope, but the truth is you don't, you don't really know everybody in here. And, 
And I can encourage you, and we can have a good time, but about, I mean, Wednesday's coming. How many of y'all know that? Thursday's right around the corner, and about Wednesday or Thursday, we need to be in a small group together to encourage, put courage into one another again, so we can kick Friday in the teeth and overcome Saturday, and we're back on Sunday. That is God's plan, because he knows not only do we need a deep, intimate relationship with him, just in case we're on the ledge by ourselves, to know I'm never by myself, he never leaves me, he never forsakes me, but I gotta have courageous associations so that when the time comes, I'll step into that. The third way to get greater courage comes from walking in obedience slash discipline to God's word. Walking in obedience slash discipline to God's word. We all know, and I've quoted uh, Joshua chapter one, verse nine, where it says, be strong and So we know that, but sometimes we say things and we don't connect the top part so verse 8 says this, speaking to Joshua, God, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. There's the little chihuahua word again. Do not be frightened, do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So he's not just telling him, hey, swell up, be courageous. He's saying, walk in obedience to my word, not because you have to or because I'll, I'll like you more if you do, but because obedience to the word, discipline in your life, it makes you more courageous. It makes you stronger. Think about it this way in the practical. Let's just say you decided to do something hard, like, okay, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit drinking the Alabama Genie in the bottle, also known as Mountain Dew. I'm going to give it up. Too much caffeine, too much sugar, I'm stopping. And you lay that bad boy down. Two days into it, you'd think you won a North Alabama powerlifting competition. You walk around with your chest stuck out. I ain't drank Mountain Dew in two days. Look at me. Woo! You ain't lifted a weight. You ain't run a mile. You ain't done nothing but quit some Mountain Dew. But you all swole up talking about, look what I can do. Listen, that is so true in the supernatural. How many of you can remember when you got baptized? Two. Then I need to baptize a bunch of y'all. We're just going to load the tank up. How many of you can remember? Like, okay, I remember when I got baptized. All right, look, here's the truth. That's, that's obedience to God's word. Now, look, if this church... We don't believe the Bible teaches nobody teaches that baptism saves you. But look here. We don't teach it. You can take it or leave it. It's not an option. God says be baptized, so you should. Um, and if you don't, if you're like, nah, I'm good. I don't need to. Then, then we, we have to have a question about did you cross the line of faith? It, it's no different than when I got married to Benet. If she just said, put this ring on, I'm like, nah, I'm good. I don't need the ring to tell everybody I'm married. No, 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 no. She would have said, no, you do. You're wearing a... Matter of fact, the first ring she bought me wouldn't hardly go on. Once I got it on, it wasn't coming off. I had to get it cut off a few years later. I saw somebody go, wow. Yeah, that's the real deal for us. If I'm in, we in. So listen, if you're, if you're like, I love Jesus, I'm saved, we'll be baptized. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm good. Well, then we have to have a conversation. So we don't teach take or leave it. We don't teach it that it saves you, but it's super, super important. Now, here's why I made, make that distinction. You started your journey out saying yes to God's commandments. How great, how powerful, and how strong did you feel? Remember when you came up out the water? That's the same way you felt in worship. You talk about, I'm, I'm about to kick the devil in the teeth. This is, woo! I mean, everybody in here was screaming. You were screaming. Man, it was, it was nuts. You were like, yeah, I'm so glad. You went to Walmart wet. Didn't care. Look at me. I'm baptized. That same momentum happens in both the practical and the spiritual life. The more, the more you say yes to God, the more you do sometimes what things are difficult. Man, you just get all swole up spiritually, and you know you can make the next stand. He was faithful then. He'll be faithful then. I'm not worried. My God is with me. I will not be dismayed. Listen to this quote, and I'm closing. A kingdom is not destroyed by wicked people. It is not necessary that people be wicked, but only that they who serve the kingdom be cowards. 
Let me read it again. A kingdom is not destroyed by wicked people. It is not necessary that people be wicked, but only that they who serve the kingdom be cowards. We have a choice to make in our life. And I want to encourage, I want to put some courage in you. First, I want to tell you, listen, here's how you get it. I understand. I was where you are, totally oblivious, living life apart from God, trying to get it all figured out. And I didn't have a whole lot of courage. But once I gave my life to Christ, he came in, put his spirit in me. All of a sudden, I had some, but I didn't have all that was available. And so for everybody else in here who's, who's made that decision, here's how you develop it. Man, listen. Grow that intimate relationship with God. Get to know your dad really, really well. And I promise you, when he says jump, you'll jump. Even if you don't have somebody with you. But it, when listen, when you're worried, you're not really sure, get some courageous associations. So when it's time to speak up, when it's time to do that thing or say that word, that they're with you and you know, man, okay, we're going to do this together. We're jumping. And listen, the more, the more you step in, the more you obey God's word, I'm just telling you, it builds this, this crazy thing called momentum. So if you're in here and you're a guy, raise your hand if you're a guy, you're a male a dude. I'm going to read a verse of scripture, and I'm specifically speaking to males in this auditorium and online. And a lot of times when you read scripture and you see the word man or men, Sometimes it, it does mean both and, but this specific scripture actually is speaking to males. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be men of courage. Remember what I told you that word meant. Be men that are willing to stand in the gap, act on what they believe, irregardless if it makes me uncomfortable, irregardless if it's hard, irregardless if it causes me pain, irregardless if it brings disapproval uh, on me, be men of courage and be strong. Guys, look at me. Somebody asked me the other day, um, I was doing a coaching session at a company, and they said, oh, you're like a preacher. I said, yeah. Why do you think the world is the way it is? Is it because we took prayer out of school? Well, I think that's a uh, sub-problem to it. So do you think it's this? Do you think it's this? Do you think it's when really he took ten commandments out of the courtroom? Like he went down all this list of all these things that he had identified. And I said, no, man, let me tell you what it, why I think it is. It's because good men decided to be silent. That's it. Good men who knew the right thing to say and the right thing to do did what I do sometimes. It's not going to matter. Nobody's going to listen. I don't know why it's not worth your effort. Nobody's listening anyway. Hey, it's not your problem. The world's going to hell in a handbasket anyway. Just come over here. Guard your little family. Do your little thing. Let everybody else do what they want to do. And the truth is, the reason we, have, the reason we are where we are today is because we haven't listened very well to 1 Corinthians 16. Men, be on guard. Pay attention to what's happening in the world. Stand firm in the faith of Jesus Christ. Be men of courage, those that would stand on the edge and bring a voice where a voice is needed. Listen to me, not your opinion. we got enough opinions. The truth, the word of God, that's what transformed people. And then it says, be strong. And then because I'm talking to men, and he was too, he says in verse 14, let all that you do be done in love. Man, God's smart. Because there's a bunch of dudes, if I told you that you'd load up here and you'd go rip somebody in you, and they said, whoa, 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 wait a minute, testosterone. Let all that you do be done in love. I don't agree with what this guy necessarily stands for, but this quote, quote is pretty powerful. Gandhi said, a coward is incapable of exhibiting love. It is the prerogative of the brave. If you're going to show love, you got to be brave. If you're really going to press in and love people who are unlovable, let's just be honest, you got to be brave. You got you cannot shrink back. You cannot be a coward. Joshua 1 9 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be like a chihuahua. Stop snapping and barking at everybody and walking around like you're scared to death. For he is our God. In his right hand, he supports you by his justice, not the justice of the world. So as you leave today, I want you to be encouraged. 
develop your relationship with God. Know you're in courageous association. Like just do the next right thing. Whatever God's word says, hard as it is, it'll build momentum because 1 John 4, 18 says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So listen, everybody online, look, come back to church. I got it. COVID-19, we had to do some things. We were out for like 12 weeks. We had to do six foot of distance and all this. We wear masks. I got all that. But the truth is, CDC just came out and said there's a 99 point something survival rate. If you get it, they've changed that story. They've said it's not as transferable as it used to be. We made a mistake. We probably shouldn't have made all these things. And listen, I'm just telling you, the enemy wants to deceive you in thinking, I'm being cautious, I'm kind of slinking back, I don't want to come to church, but yet we go to Lowe's, we go to Walmart, we go wherever we want to go, but we won't come to church. Come to church. The church literally means the gathering of his people, and I got it if you're out there and you're watching online because you can't. I understand. Thank God for online. I appreciate it. But look, if you're choosing your comfort of sitting in your bed in your underwear over being here, there are people that need you here. They need to see you coming. They need to see you be the example. Show courage. Don't choose comfort. When you're out there and you're in the world, be a voice. Look at your neighbor and say, you have a voice. It's needed. What's not needed is your opinion. There's a fine line between my opinion and what the Bible says. Make sure you always quote scripture in the context it should be quoted to bring a kingdom perspective to a land that's honestly hurting really, really bad right now. Be a voice of hope. Be a voice of good news. Be joy. And honestly, man, that takes courage. All of us have been in environments where people are sad and we're like, well, maybe I shouldn't be happy. Maybe you should be. Maybe you're the one that's going to bring the joy of the room up. You got to discern that. I understand that. But I just, I just want you to go today. Be encouraged and show courage because I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the world needs you. You have a unique voice. You have a gift set that nobody else has to do things that nobody else can do. I'm not trying to puff you up. I'm just telling you that's what the Word of God says. You are beautifully and wonderfully made. God made no mistake when he made you in your personality and in your gifting. And Be courageous. Make your voice loud. Say it when it needs to be said. Serve when it needs to be served. Love when nobody else is loving. And the world will legitimately begin to be healed because of you, because of me, because of all of us.